as wounds which mar the chosen. Good morning. Welcome to Westside this morning. If you're here with us in person, we're so glad to see you. And if you're visiting with us online, welcome to the live stream as well. Just a few announcements before we get started this morning. Uh, Eagle Fern Camp is uh, going strong, and we have a number of Westside campers and Westside counselors who are involved in that this summer. So be keeping the camp in your prayers. Many have come to Christ and, and grown in Him as a result of experiences uh, at camp. Uh, the ladies are still meeting every Tuesday morning at Jen Blazek's homes at 10 a.m., so ladies, take advantage of that. And uh, the men's breakfasts are still going strong. Uh, the uh, deacons and elders asked me just to give you a very brief update on, on our finances, and there's a couple of specific elements that I wanted to mention this morning. First of all, there are several more camps coming up. High school camp is coming up after that. Girls camp, we have junior high camp coming up. And if finances are holding you back in any way, we don't want that to be the case. So make sure you see Paul Kaufman or any one of the elders or deacons if you have a child who would like to go to camp but it hasn't signed up yet. Um, additionally, we thought it would be helpful for you to know that uh, we partner with the Salvation Army financially and they do a good work uh, for the, the poor and the homeless in our area. So we, we reach out to them individually on, on occasion, but also we, we have a close partnership with Salvation Army financially. So we thought that would be good information for you to know. And then finally, just um, want you to know that our last joint meeting, we were very encouraged about our financial status. We're, we're in good, solid shape, and we appreciate your, your giving to Westside and just encourage you to continue to prayerfully uh, be involved in, in that uh, act of worship as well. Uh, before we continue, let's pray together. Father in heaven, what a joy it is to be together uh, one more time uh, this morning and to uh, lift up the name of Jesus in, in song and in remembrance and with a message. And Father, we pray that we might have our hearts of, of worship, that we might be attentive to what your spirit would have for us this morning. And we will thank you in advance for what you do in our meeting time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Too far. 
has no sorrow that heaven can't Sometimes we sing that song, and I, um, I think about just um, how that message can come off. Come as you are can be kind of like, you know, your sin's not a big deal. But the truth is, our sin is a way bigger deal than we even comprehend. But we can come as we are this morning, not because God's just like, eh, no big deal, but rather because he understands the big deal that our rebellion toward him is, and he has dealt with it finally and fully at the cross of Jesus Christ. So we come this morning not to talk about how great we feel or how terrible we feel. No matter how you feel, you have a sacrifice that has been made for you that is good for the Father. And your standing before Jesus is not based on your experience here this morning or your experience in the last week or in the last 24 years. Your standing before the Father, our standing before the Father is completely based on what Jesus Christ has done for us. And this morning, I'm so grateful for that because the last couple of weeks have been a little bit crazy in our house. And, uh, and it's good to remember this is not about what we bring here to God. It's celebrating what Jesus has already brought to the Father. And the Father said, it's good. It's good. So we remember what Jesus has done. And that's what this next song talks about. This next song is the gospel for the church. It's the gospel for the church to remember, to realize, to drink anew every week. And that's why we break bread. That's why we have communion. We share it every week because it's so important because we are so quick to forget. So let's, uh, let's sing this song. It's called Not In Me. And it might be a new one for some of you, but this is a, man, this is a tremendous gospel truth song. I 
Well, good morning. Um, we have an opportunity now to celebrate the Lord's Supper. You know, when I was um, just saved, I was 16 years old, and you know, I went to church to play on the sports teams. And uh, I know, high motivation, but I got, I got saved there, and uh, we, we had a church that had a balcony. You remember balconies and churches, you know, up there? And the youth group, we used to sit in the balcony. And, um, and you know, when it came time for what we called communion, we call it breaking of bread here, but we call it the communion service, it was added on once a month to the end of the service, which made the service longer, you know, and the young people, we didn't go for that very much. Anyway, we're up there, picture us, balcony, we're looking down. And, uh, and it ended up, inevitably, by singing a song called In the Garden. Anybody remember In the Garden? Try looking over the words. Anyway, the trouble is, we were never, as young people, we'd play with the juice, you know? And uh, no one ever explained to us what it meant. We were just sort of expected to take it. So this morning, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna to explain to myself what this means and you can listen in. Deal? Okay. The Passover was the most sacred feast in the Jewish year. It, it, it remembered, remember that word, remember, it remembered the final plague on Egypt when the firstborn of all the Egyptians died and the Israelis were spared because of the blood of the lamb that was sprinkled on the doorpost. Now you can find that all in Exodus 12. The Passover lamb was slaughtered on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was the day before the Passover. This was extremely significant to commemorate God's salvation from death by, by the lamb's blood speared on the doorpost. Okay. The lamb was the Hebrews' last meal they ate before leaving Egypt. Now that feast is still celebrated today, but you know what they do? They miss the greater deliverance. It, it, that it foreshadowed the cross of Jesus Christ and our deliverance from sin. Now the unleavened bread was eaten to remind them of the haste which their ancestors left Egypt. They had salt water, to remind them of the many tears shed during the years of slavery in Egypt. They ate bitter herbs to remind them the bitterness of slavery and the hyssop used to sprinkle the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. They had a sweet mixture of apples and dates and pomegranate nuts with cinnamon sticks, which reminded them of the clay and the straw their ancestors used to make bricks while in slavery. Were actually four cups of wine, not just one, there were four, during the course of a meal to remind them of the four promises of Exodus 6. I'm going to read them, verses 6 and 7. Therefore, say to the people of Israel, 
I am the Lord. I will free you from, the, from your oppression and will rescue you from your slavery in Egypt. I will redeem you with the powerful arm and great acts of judgment. I will claim you as my own people and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who has freed you from the oppression of Egypt. Calvary superseded the exodus from Egypt as the greatest redemptive event in history. We are not called to remember the blood on the doorpost. We are called to remember the blood shed on Calvary. Now, during the Last Supper, Jesus took a loaf of bread and gave thanks to God. And he broke it and gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So that's why we were up there in the balcony. <laughs> we were supposed to be remembering him. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. That's in Luke 22. Now, he concluded the feast by singing a hymn. That's in Matthew 26. And I presume that's why we sang in the garden afterwards and then we all went home. It was there, as predicted, Jesus was betrayed. And the following day, Jesus was crucified. Now, the accounts of the Lord's Supper are found in the Gospels. Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and John 13. But the Apostle Paul also wrote about it these are, the, these are the things I wish I knew when, when I was a teenager. Uh, he wrote about it in 1 Corinthians 11. Paul includes a statement not found in the Gospels. It says, therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Now, a man ought to, Paul says, examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment to himself. Now, I always thought that that meant, you know, an unworthy, unworthy manner meant a disregard for the true meaning of the bread and cup. You know, not realizing the, the tremendous price our Savior paid for our salvation. Other people have suggested that what happened with them, it became... A, a dead and formal ritual. And to others, it was the Lord's Supper was uh, it, you shouldn't come with unconfessed sin. Now, when we were up there in the balcony, we used to look down and find out who didn't take the Lord's Supper. And then this is, this is confession time, you know. It doesn't go outside this building. <laughs> but we used to look down and find out who didn't take it and wonder why, you know. Now, none of you ever did that, did you? And so, and, and, and that's, you know, maybe what, what did they do that made them, you know? Another statement Paul made that's not included in the gospel is, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It doesn't get any better than that. Now, from these brief accounts, we learn how Jesus used two of the frailest elements as symbols of his body and blood, bread and wine. Not quite as frail as these are, but still frail. He declared that the bread spoke of his body, which would be broken. Now, no bones were broken, so it refers to how badly tortured he was on the cross. The wine spoke of his blood, indicating the terrible death he would experience for our sin. He, the perfect Son of God, became the fulfillment of the countless Old Testament prophecies concerning a Redeemer. When he said, do this in remembrance of me, he indicated this was a ceremony that must be continued into the future. So that's why we do it every Sunday. It is indicated also that the Passover, which required the death of a lamb, was looking forward to the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. The sacrificial system was no longer needed, Hebrews chapter 9. The Lord's Supper is a remembrance of what Christ did for us and a celebration 
of what we receive as a result of his sacrifice. In Acts, it says, upon hearing Peter's message on the day of Pentecost, this is in Acts 2, 41, 42, those who accepted the message were baptized. And about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Can you imagine 3,000 one day? Then in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Ian is going to speak in a few minutes. To the fellowship. We had some. We're going to have some more. To the breaking of bread and to prayer. To the breaking of bread, where we remember what the Lord Jesus did for us. I wish I'd have known that when I was a teenager. Let's do that now. Let's take a little time and remember what Jesus did for us. Lord, do bless this time together. Bless each heart, Lord. Bless each person who's come. Help us to remember what you did for us, that you set us free from the bondage of sin. Lord, we thank you so much. In Jesus' name. You know, um, I'm going to pray for a couple of countries right now, and the reason I'm going to is that I've received emails from friends who live in those countries asking for specific prayer for them, for their communities, the faith communities, and for the country as a whole. I'm speaking of South Africa, if you follow the news, and Cuba. I've been to Cuba in the last few years seven or eight times. And, uh, I love Cuba. I love I love to being there. I love the people. So let's do pray for those two countries. Lord, we bring to you our our brothers and sisters in South Africa right now. And we know that the Johannesburg particularly is in flames. And we pray, oh God, first of all, that you would give the Christians' opportunities to tell about the love of Jesus and the peace of God that passes all understanding. And then, Lord, we do pray for peace, peace in that land, Lord, that you would bring it about. 
And, and Lord, that, that evil would no longer have its way. Lord, we lift that country up to you. And then, Lord, we turn to our friends in Cuba. Lord, uh, we, 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 we pray for them also. We pray, oh God, that in the midst of all of this turmoil, that your people would have a chance to talk about Jesus, talk about the salvation, talk about what we just celebrated, about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And Lord, we do pray that you would bring about a peaceful conflict, a, a solution to this conflict. Lord, have your way. Bring about your will, O oh, Jesus. And now, Lord, we think about ourselves. We know there are several of us here who are, who are uh, working on illnesses, some that we're going to have operations and different things. We pray, O oh God. Lord, that you would heal everyone who is sick. And Lord, those who go to doctors and have to go, we pray that that doctor, that nurse, those people would know that this is a person that trusts Jesus, that walks with you. We pray that, that, that your name would resound out with the doctors and the nurses as, as they're there. Lord, we pray for those who are discouraged, Lord, that you administer to their hearts only as you can, Lord. Lord, lift them up, Lord. Show them your promises, the peace that, 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 is in, that can be in their hearts because they know you. So, Lord, now we look, we pray. We pray for Dan. We, we pray for Amy. We pray for the rest of the song service. And, oh, God, do bless Ian as he opens your word, Lord, that there would be a fresh word for each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen.
Lord, we thank you so much that we know that you are faithful. You are faithful in our lives. You're faithful in your church. And God, we thank you for the, um, for the reminder that we celebrated this morning, that our hope is, is, uh, is not found in something uh, that, is, that is up to us to bring, something us to do. Our hope is found in Jesus and his finished, fully finished work for us. So we thank you for that. Now, Lord, we ask that you'd speak um, through Ian. Uh, speak through your word for us today, Lord. Speak through the Sunday school teachers today. Lord, may the gospel go out clearly. May you open up eyes to see. Give us ears to hear what your spirit says to the church today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we're going to go ahead and invite all uh, everybody who is five years old to fifth grade out to Sunday school. And Ian's going to come on and finish up Ephesians for us. Well, good morning. Let's do a little better on that west side. Every time I'm up here, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That's what I like to hear. Well, this morning, I have the enormous, uh, enormous uh, privilege and honor to be able to finish out our series on Ephesians. We have been in Ephesians since late October of last year, and today is the last day. I want to open again to continue this time in prayer and ask that God will move powerfully and will speak to each one of us where we are at. Father, we thank you again so much for this morning. Lord, it is a good morning when we get to gather together. In our weakness, Lord, move and move through us. In our weariness, give us strength. We surrender to you right now. We know that you are a good God who is full of love and compassion. And Lord, meet us where we are at right now as your children. In your name, Jesus, amen. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. That is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. Just because... It's the last sermon, the last few verses of Ephesians. Would you mind doing something special for me? Would you mind, for those who are able, would you mind standing as we read from God's word? So stand with me if you're able, if you're physically able or wanting. I'm also going to start in verse 18 because verse 19 is, is a continuation of verse 18 specifically. These are Paul's final words to the Ephesian church. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak, so that you also may know how I am and what I'm doing. Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. You may be seated. This is God's word. In verse 19, it starts with the word and. Usually when the word and is used, it is connecting two thoughts together. And so it is important to not only look at verse 18, but go even farther back to verse 10 in chapter 6. But I want to zoom out even further, because as we end the, the letter to the Ephesians, I think it's important to do at least a brief summary of, of some of what we've been learning and speaking through and what Ephesians is all about. Chapters 1 through 3 are all about the gospel, who God is, who Jesus is, his great plan for us. 
what the gospel should mean in our lives, how it transforms lives. And then chapters four through six are all about how do we actually live out the gospel in our daily lives? What does this practically look like? Some of you may have heard of the Bible Project, and they actually sum up the, sum up the letter to the Ephesians really well in one sentence, and it's this. The gospel story should recreate every aspect of our story. The gospel story should recreate every aspect of our story. The gospel has the power to transform every single life in this room and in this world. And here in our passage, in, or at least in chapter 6 and verse 10, we see Paul's final words to the Ephesian church. He uses the word finally in chapter 6, verse 10, which means that these words matter. If you were to write a letter to someone and it was your last letter to them, what would you say? He says, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We cannot do this on our own and even far from it. Any strength we have comes from Jesus first and foremost. And he goes deeper on these last few Sundays, we've been talking about the armor of God, which is the spiritual army that we, the armor that we put on. That our battle in this world, in this, in this life on this side of heaven, is not against flesh and blood. It's not against other humans. It is not against governments. It is not against political parties. It is against the spiritual powers of darkness. It is against the adversary. Who does everything he can to deceive, to lead us astray, and to distract us from the truth of Jesus. We see that in our world currently in many different ways. And Paul was encouraging the Ephesian church to put on that armor. I'm not going to go in detail to the armor. I encourage you to read it for yourself and look at the sermons in the last month or so on that. But even further in verse 18, that sets up verse 19 in chapter 6, we see that Paul says, praying at all times in the Spirit. Paul knew that when we put on the armor of God, prayer has to permeate every aspect of it. Prayer is a falling on your knees, whether physically or even mentally before the God of this universe, realizing your place. That strength only comes from him, that he is God and you are not. He is in control, you are not. It is in prayer that we rely on him to work in and through us and through others. Our war should be in prayer. And it is here where Paul gets really personal. Paul himself in verse 19 says, pray and also for me. Don't just pray for all the saints or all the fellow believers in Ephesus or around the known world at this time, but also pray for me. But why? Why does Paul need prayer? Isn't Paul the hero? Isn't Paul this almost like this superhuman? Paul is a human just like you and I. And he desperately needs prayer just like you and I. He says, I am an ambassador in chains. Mo most scholars believe that Paul is writing this when he is in Rome in his final imprisonment. His life will soon most likely be drawing to a close here on earth. He's quite literally in a prison in chains, just like many of our brothers and sisters are around the world. And Paul describes himself as an ambassador. And what is an ambassador? 
An ambassador is someone who represents their home country to another country. It is like an ambassador from the U.S. going to France to represent the U.S. ideals and values in the people and to be a resource for the French government in, in communicating to the American government. But Paul is an ambassador not of Rome, not of Israel or another nation. He's an ambassador of the one true king. His name's Jesus. He is an ambassador of another kingdom that is here on earth and also not of this earth. It is the kingdom of God. And see, ambassadors usually have diplomatic immunity, which means that even if war were to break out or if the, the ambassador becomes persona non grata, they get to go back home without getting into prison. You see the paradox here. Paul is an ambassador, yet he's in chains. Following Jesus doesn't always look like the other, doesn't look like the other philosophies or ideas or ways of this world. And sometimes, and many of the times, following Jesus means you may be imprisoned for the hope that you have. And Paul is most likely about to go in front of Caesar. At this time, the Roman emperor was Nero. And if you know anything about Nero, he was not the greatest of men. He would later blame the Christians for burning down a part of Rome, which then unleashed all kinds of persecution. This was the man that, he, that Paul was about to go in front of. And notice that Paul asked for boldness boldness. He doesn't ask for food and water or for clothing or for safety or even to be freed from prison. He asks for boldness. Boldness is uninhibited, courageous speech or action. See, Paul knew the spiritual dark forces were around him. And he knew that they would stop everything, he do everything they can to stop him from proclaiming the gospel in the prison system in front of Caesar, and he needed prayer. And he knew that prayer is the basis for boldness. You want strength to share the gospel? Pray. Pray and pray more. But what is this gospel? Is this gospel worth being in prison for? All of Ephesians, and particularly chapters one through three, is all about what the gospel is. See, I don't want to be cliche, but the gospel, we must start with the bad news first. Because it, is, it wouldn't be truly good news unless we actually understand who we truly are and how broken we are as humans. We are broken sinners. Sin, to put, it, to put it simply as Timothy Keller does, is sin is looking to something else besides God for your salvation. Sin is looking to something else besides God for your salvation. And we are so good at that, aren't we? Our hearts are idol factories. We look to anything but everything to be God to us, or we elevate ourselves as God. We manipulate and we abuse and we hurt. We do what we can to, to try to be loved and known and seen. And sometimes in the process, we cause mass chaos. Just as Jim prayed for South Africa and Cuba, there are power grabs happening. People are dying. And at the core of it, and, and there's nuance to these, these problems, but the core of it is our human sin. We are broken and weak, but God. But God, if you look at chapter 2, verse 4 in Ephesians, though while we are still in our sin, 
That even when we were dead in our trespasses and our sins, he made us alive. Jesus made us alive together with Christ. And it's by grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The gospel is that the Father sent the one and only Son into this world to become one of us, our perfect human representative. He took on flesh. His whole life was atoning. He was living a life that we could never live. He lived, he was perfect and sinless. He was mocked and persecuted. And he ultimately went to an old rugged cross. He went to a cross where he ultimately died. He was the final sacrifice. It was the one that the Passover was looking to, that there was no more sacrifices, that it is one God, one faith, one hope. In the one man, Jesus Christ, in the one cross, all was paid for at once at that moment in history. And Jesus said, it is finished. The, the, the curtain was torn in two in the temple. The, the, the dividing wall hostility between Jews and Gentiles was, was cast down. And now it is in, in God and one body through the cross that hope is found. And Jesus didn't just lay in that grave. He rose again on that third day, leaving death in the grave so we could have life and have it abundantly. So we could actually experience forgiveness of sin and true hope. We all long to be seen and known, to be heard, to be loved. And only God can offer that in a way that no human could ever offer. And what is our response? How will you respond to that gospel, to the true good news? Repentance, turning from your sin and saying, Jesus, I cannot fix myself. Only you can heal and redeem me. You are God, I am not. Pledge your allegiance to him because he is worth falling because Paul's in prison at this moment, not this moment, but in this moment in Ephesians. And he is willing to die for the gospel. If it is truly good news and if it's the best news in the world, I believe Jesus is worth dying for. And I love that he not only just says praying for boldness, but also as I ought. The word ought means a necessity, it means a must. Sharing the gospel for Paul was not an option. It was a necessary thing to do because the world is dying. And he wanted nothing more than to see as many people come to know Jesus as possible. You know, for us, I think there's much we can gain from this passage. But here, our context is different from Paul's. And the question I want to ask here, Paul's context was that he was in prison in Rome and he was asking for boldness in his situation. What is your context? Where has God put you? Where has God put you? I want to share two stories. Two stories how God has been moving recently in this current environment. And one of them takes place in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, a parent, one of our youth, sent me a podcast um, by um, a female um, writer and, and, and communicator named Jenny Allen. And, um, and she had these two guys, Daniel and Luke, on her podcast to share about how God utilized them in a very crazy and unique way. Now bear with me. Daniel and Luke are two college students in Nashville, Tennessee. They are actively disciple, discipling the younger generation and actually creating a team of evangelists. 
And uh, Luke was actively, is, is, was mentoring a few high school students. And these high school students told Luke, hey, Luke, do you know about these raves that high school students are going to? And if you don't know what raves are, they are all night parties um, to electronic dance music where there is quite a bit of drinking and drugs and usual, usually casual sex and lots of sexual immorality. It is a very dark environment. And thousands of high school students were going to these raves all throughout Nashville. And at that moment, Luke had a, a burden for these youth, for these high schoolers who were living contrary to the gospel, and he wanted to see them to come to know Jesus. And God put a burden on him and his friend Daniel's heart to somehow reach those kids. And it was crazy what God was asking them to do. God put it in their heart to go to one of those raves and proclaim the gospel just for five minutes. And so God provided in all these different ways. They got to meet the high school students who were running the raves as their business. And the kids were like, we've been looking for a purpose for so long. And so Luke uh, and Daniel, they brought 50 of their mentees to this rave. Again, I'm not endorsing some of these things necessarily, but God was moving in a very particular way in their context. They go to this rave, and at the very end, they preach the gospel for five or ten minutes. And you know what happens? The spirit moves. More than 400 kids give their life to Christ. Y'all, this is Gen Z we're talking about. God is moving in Gen Z in powerful ways. Don't lose hope for them. I believe there is renewal and revival happening. And what I love even more is they had a follow-up night the next week where over 500 kids came to a worship night, and I think over 100 more gave their life to Christ. And those kids are being discipled in the best way they can. God is moving. And I also want to share one more story of dear friends of my wife, Abby's and I. They live in Hawaii, and they love skateboarding, their whole family. And during the pandemic, um, they couldn't go to the skate park. And so what did they do naturally? They built some ramps in their backyard with the space, the, the small space they had. And before they knew it, kids from around the neighborhood were coming to their house to learn to skateboard and, and just to try out their tricks and skills and get better. And before they knew it, they started a skate ministry. The, the, um, the, the wife of this family, she is an introvert. It was really hard to open her home to so many people coming in. But you know what she said? I'm going to put some of the things to the side. I'm going to love these people coming in. And many of these kids and many of these families coming into their home do not know Jesus. And do that, they have devotionals and they just skate. And they're modeling to their kids what it looks like to be disciples to Jesus and to disciple others. I share these stories because God can move in the most ordinary of people, like you and I. God loves utilizing weak people for his mission. What is your context? Where has God put you? Are you at Nike? Are you at Intel? Are you in the construction industry? Are you working at a grocery store? Are you pumping gas? Wherever you are, God has put you there for a reason. And, you're, and that is your mission ground. That is your ministry. Don't lose sight of that. Preaching the gospel does not come just with me on the stage here. It comes from you and I being intentional in whatever context we are. And I just want to share actually four quick things about how we can share the gospel in our present context. We can go to the next slide briefly. First one is pray. I know I've been saying that a lot. Pray, 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 and pray more. Be on your knees because God loves answering prayers when you're asking him to move through you to impact other people. And be ready. God will answer your prayer. God will answer your prayer. And it takes some patience. But he'll start opening your eyes to the needs around you. 
And you're going to have opportunities come up to you you never thought you would have. Interruption. So much of our lives is planned. If you're like me, I'm a to-do list person. I am a planner to the T. I love going from this, this, and this with all efficiency. But often God loves to interrupt us. God loves to interrupt us, and he usually in the interruptions, God wants to move. That God wants to open your eyes. We must be ready for those interruptions because that is where God can move the most. Thirdly, relationship. I think often we overcomplicate sharing the gospel to people. If you know the gospel, then man, you are able to share it. Who has God put in your life? What coworkers? What family, what neighbors, God's put them in your life for a reason. Just build relationships. Be intentional, be thoughtful, get to know them for who they are in their story. And through that, you will earn trust usually and a right to be heard and you get to share your story, how Jesus has impacted your life. And fourth, we live. Are you modeling the way of Jesus in your life? And I'm going to talk about that just a little bit later from now. Are you living the gospel story in how you live? If people know you, do they know that you love and follow Jesus? Can they see it by how you live and your actions? Who has God put in your life? Pray for them and see how God will move. I believe the more God takes the throne of our heart, the less fear there will be and the more boldness we will have in sharing the gospel. Jesus is worth following. And as we move forward in Ephesians, as we finish up Ephesians, Paul goes from finishing his, his, kinda his, his, his conversation and plea to the Ephesian church to now a final greeting and then to a benediction. He sends a man named Tychicus, and you, I will let you learn how to pronounce that yourself as well. I was, there's like three different ways you can pronounce it. I tried, nothing seemed final, so I'm just going with that one, Tychicus. Tychicus was a faithful minister and beloved brother of Paul. He was the, he was the messenger. He was the one who traveled mul- multiple weeks to go to Ephesus Rome to Ephesus, and Ephesus is in modern-day Turkey. And he was the one who self-delivered this physical letter to the church. And I love the heart of Paul here. He wants the church to know how they are in Rome, but also wants to encourage them. Can you imagine being the church in Ephesus and Tychicus comes, who you probably know because he's also, from, he's also most likely from Turkey too, modern day Turkey, and reading the letter of Ephesians to you, could you imagine? Paul was most likely the one who brought you to Christ or one of his own disciples. And hearing this letter, how powerful that would have been and how powerful the letter of Ephesians is to this day. I just have one question for you in this little section. Tychicus was sent to encourage the Ephesian church. Who recently has encouraged you? Who stepped into your life via text, email, in person, phone call, FaceTime, maybe a hologram that's coming soon, probably? (laughs) Who has encouraged you recently? Because we all need it, don't we? We all need it. If someone brings your heart and mind, even right now, someone to encourage, can I challenge you? Don't wait too long. Encourage them. Maybe there's a reason why God has brought them to your heart and mind. And here are the last two verses of Ephesians. 
Paul ends with a benediction. A benediction, this is a very formal word that means a blessing. The last two lines of the letter to the Ephesian church. Paul says, peace be to the brothers. He also it says, peace be to the brothers in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love or love undying in some of your translations. Peace, love, faith, and grace are common themes all throughout the letter to the Ephesian church. And Paul, pretty much what he's saying by using these words again, is that may you increase more and more in these. May your faith grow in Jesus. And as your faith grows, your love for him will grow. And as your love for him grows, your faith will grow in him. And may peace be rooted in me. Because peace and grace and love are first find their home in God. And that is in which we can be, be sowers of peace and show grace to others who don't even deserve it and love those who is hard to love. They all find their source in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to focus briefly on this verse 24 where Paul says, Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. This could be a whole sermon on its own. What does it look like to love God in our daily lives? How does that look? There's many places in scripture we could go to, but I'm just going to go to chapter 5 of Ephesians, verse 1 through 2, where Paul says this, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. How did Jesus show his love for us? He gave his life for us. Love looks like a cross. And we too are called to die to ourselves and take up our own cross. That we are no longer, if you call yourself a Christian, you follow Jesus, that you are no longer your own, that you were bought with a price. That you are no longer the center of your own universe, that Jesus is life now. Jesus is your life. And nothing but him. We can only love God because he first loved us. You want to learn how to love God? Look to Jesus. And I think part of that answer is being an imitator. Model your life after the way, truth, and life of Jesus. Does your life look like his? And if you're like me, if you just take some self-reflection time, you realize it is far from Jesus. There is much room to grow and build in, but oh, how powerful the grace of God. How good his forgiveness for us. And as we learn to love God more and more with an undying and incorruptible love, May we rest that even when we fall and make mistakes and fail, that God's grace is sufficient for us. And keep moving forward, brother and sister. Don't give up. There is nothing better than loving God. He is worth following. Give your time to him. He is worth it. Not just 15 minutes in the morning, but your day. Constantly and consistently seeking him in prayer and making his, his name known to those around you. Do you love him? If you do, then follow him. Instead of finishing um, in, a, in a word of prayer, I actually want to read the last few, um, from chapter 10 to verse 18 and verses 23 through 24 as a benediction. 
church. May we live these verses out in our lives. May they not be empty words, but be something that we actualize in our life. Maybe close your eyes as I read these, and may they impact you in a new way. And may we live this out as the church, as a community in our homes and in our world, because there is a world broken and lost. There is a war happening to try to deceive and distract us. And may we take the last words of Paul and may they encourage our hearts because we desperately need it. Finally, West Side, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, West side, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication and to that end, keep alert West side with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Peace be to you in love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Amen. Thank you, Ian, for that message. If you know Jesus, you can prayerfully consider how you can go boldly and he can use you to proclaim the good news. Ian, I appreciate your love for God and your commitment to his word and your devotion to Jesus. Thank you for sharing that message with us this morning. Uh, this does wrap up our study in Ephesians. Next week, we'll begin a study on what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus. So we'll be looking at different texts for the next several weeks. Uh, defining that, and, and we look forward to having you learn with us uh, what Scripture has to say about what that looks like. Um, additionally, uh, this week on Tuesday, you should have received an email with a, a youth ministry update, and if you didn't, I just wanted to reiterate that a little bit this morning. Um, Ten days ago, uh, we received an official um, uh, announcement from Ian that they're moving to the East Coast. And that, that, that's very disappointing to us. But if you don't hear anything else today, I want you to hear this, that we love Ian and Abby very much. And we want the very best for them. And we're looking forward to what God has in store for them. So we're, we're also committed to our youth ministry here at Westside. We, we've already had discussions. Many of us are praying about it. We'll be meeting this week. And we want you to join with us. This, this is not a downtime. This is an exciting time to see how God is going to provide here at Westside. We are committed to youth ministry. We're committed to our young people. We love them very much. And we want you to pray with us and, and join with us in asking how God's going to fill that need. And we're looking, looking forward to that. Uh, so greet uh, Ian and Abby. We love them. They're always welcome back. Don't... don't uh, don't get confused by that at all. We love them. They're going to go back east and, and continue their education. They'll be able to live closer to uh, Abby's folks, and we wish the very best for them. I just want to end with this, this, uh, this verse from Philippians 4. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Can I pray? And then you'll be dismissed. 
Father in heaven, we, we love you. We, we thank you for uh, your word that was spoken this morning. Uh, we thank you that uh, if we know you, you give us the tools and the armor that we need to live in victory and even to pass on the message of this good news. Father, we thank you for, for Ian and, and for his message this morning. Uh, bless him and, and Abby this afternoon and in the coming days and weeks ahead. Father, go with us this morning. We thank you for your goodness. We, we look forward to what you're going to accomplish in each one of our lives and in our church. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.